We'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Danielle Meyer. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Pharmacology at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. And she'll be uh, discussing with us today the development CCDD exposure results in multi-generational histological transcriptomic and methylomic abnormalities in male zebrafish gonads. Danielle? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks for being here today. All right. Let's see. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Um, okay, so today I'm talking about early life dioxin exposure in zebrafish and the later life effects on fertility. So to start with, our lab generally looks at the effects of low level exposure to environmental endocrine disruptors during critical periods of development, and then the effects later in life and across uh, multiple generations. So to start with, we look at um, environmentally relevant levels of endocrine disruptors, even though they're detected at levels often below a part per billion range. Um, and we look at these levels because although it's such a small amount in the environment, um, the endocrine system is primed to respond to even very small shifts in hormone concentration. So even a very low dose exposure could be relevant for health effects. And the properties of these compounds also contribute to these health effects, including long half-lives and the lipophilic properties, which can result in long-term persistence in the environment, bioaccumulation through the food chain, and also uh, persistence in the human body as well. So just to emphasize the uh, concern the health concern of such a of even low level exposure to these compounds is estimated with between two and three hundred billion dollars uh, are the costs of endocrine disrupting compound leak diseases in the U.S. and EU. So we've already discussed the challenges of studying uh, these low level and long term uh, compound exposures in humans. So we use a zebrafish model, which is NIH validated and um, they are externally fertilized, which gives us the advantage of being able to observe and manipulate the major organ systems within the first few days of development. So our model endocrine disrupting compound for this exposure is TCDD or dioxin, which is how I'll refer to it for the rest of this talk, which is the most potent of the dioxins and a model aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist. So dioxin is known to have uh, its well-established multi-systemic effects in a variety of model organisms and in acute human exposures. And one of these systems targeted is the reproductive and endocrine systems, which is what we'll be focusing on. So our exposure is we expose zebrafish to waterborne uh, TCDD or dioxin at 50 parts per trillion uh, for one hour at two points during development at three and seven weeks post-fertilization. And these two time points bookend to a certain degree zebrafish sexual differentiation and uh, maturation. So we're targeting the reproductive system with these two one hour acute exposures. So we expose during the F0, raise to adulthood and spawn all the way down to the F2. The F2 in zebrafish is equivalent to the F3 in rodents and is where we would see any transgenerational effects. So looking at all three generations of these fish, one of the endpoints we found was decreased fertility, not only in the, the fish exposed as juveniles, but all the way down to the F2. So we wanted to look more closely to see if these effects on fertility were due uh, primarily to the males, females, or both. So we found uh, by doing outcrosses with control fish that in the F2 generation, um, these effects were attributed to the male lineage uh, specifically. And so not only effects on um, fertilization of eggs, but also the number of eggs released from the females was driven by the uh, dioxin lineage of male exposed fish. So these were specific to the males in the F2. And so we looked more closely at the male fish to see uh, what is going on with the male lineage all the way down to the F2 generation. And more precisely, we looked at the histology of the testes at gene expression and at whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So specifically for the histology, we looked at the percentage of cells in various stages of spermatogenesis. And we found in the F0 and in the F1 generation, an increase in the less mature spermatogonia. 
and a decrease in the more mature spermatozoa. So a sort of delayed spermiation um, in the F0 and the F1. We did not see this in the F2, however. So these effects were multi-generational, but not transgenerational. So then moving on to changes in gene expression, we looked at the testes at one year of age across all three generations, and we found that fertility related pathways were affected across all three generations, and these overlap to a great degree. And these were processes such as lipid and glucose metabolism, um, sperm cell development, and mitochondrial function. And these overlapped across generations, but interestingly, the specific genes involved did not really overlap. And this is curious because it suggests a generation specific footprint of the specific genes changed, although the overall fertility related pathways were the same. Now, one other interesting uh, point to mention for the gene expression results were that oftentimes the genes that we saw changed were upregulated, whereas due to uh, the findings of infertility and other literature, we would expect them to generally be downregulated. And so, we are looking at these samples at one year of age when the exposure is earlier in, um, is about 10 months earlier for the F0 and of course generations earlier for the F1 and F2. And so our theory for this so far is that it's possibly a compensatory upregulation to the initial insult. And the next thing that we're gonna be looking at for this is going back to the developmental period and figuring out what's going on with the gene expression networks. Are they always upregulated or are they downregulated and then upregulated later in life? So then um, moving on to, the, to some of the specific genes we saw, we found in the F0 some histone and DNA methyltransferases differentially expressed. And then in the F1 and F2, a larger degree, um, mostly histone modification genes. So from here, we start to look at whole genome bisulfite sequencing. We're first gonna look at um, methylation across the genome. And then um, our next step will be to look at histone modifications. So looking at whole genome methylation, we don't see any global changes in methylation across all three generations. But again, we see um, a large degree of pathway overlap in the genes associated with these differentially methylated sites across all three generations. So again, these are pathways involved in spermatogenesis, mitochondrial function, uh, glucose metabolism, so on and so forth. Now, interestingly, in the, um, the methylome, we found more pathways involved in endocrine function and epigenetic modification than we saw even in the transcriptome. So again, um, we also saw limited overlap with the transcriptome for all three generations. And this is interesting uh, because it suggests that there's a possibility that we're seeing um, developmental specific networks that are being dysregulated. So perhaps the methylation changes that we're seeing are altering transcriptomic programs early in life during development. And later in life, when we're assessing these fish at one year of age for all three generations, we no longer see these programs because they're no longer relevant. So again, this just highlights the importance of looking at early, what is going on early during development. Do we see more overlap with the methylome in that case? And so focusing again on the F1 and F2, um, for the F0, we saw about 500 differentially methylated sites. In the F1, it's more along the lines of 6,000. And in the F2, it's about 250. So two things to highlight here is that in the F1, we have a uniquely high number of differentially methylated sites and genes. And so this suggests that the F1 is a uniquely susceptible um, critical period for the effects of dioxin on the methylome. So the F1 will be developing germ cells within the juvenile F0, which makes sense. And then this suggests that um, the germ cells are uniquely susceptible, but that the majority of these methylation changes aren't being passed on to the F2. Now, another uh, interesting point to make is that although there are not very many methylation changes in the F0 and F2 of the ones that there are, over 90% of those overlap with at least one other generation. So then this suggests that although the large majority of methylation changes aren't heritable, there is a small core that is, that can be her inherited across generations. And so this small core will be something to look at more closely. So again, 
we've looked specifically at um, the later life effects of fertility and we've characterized the um, epigenetic or the uh, DNA methylation and the transcriptomic effects later in life of these early life exposures. But the interesting um, pathway situation where we see overlap with infertility pathways across all three generations, but very little gene overlap. And then a very similar situation with the methylome, where again, the pathways are consistent across generations and with the transcriptome, but the genes do not overlap to a great extent, suggests that we really need to go back and look at what's going on during development. Do we see more overlap at that time point with the transcriptome and across generations? And so the ongoing project I've been working on throughout the course of this year is taking longitudinal samples over that period of development, figuring out which genes are affected at what point in time during that progression of development and early uh, reproductive maturity. When are they being changed? And is there a time point at which we can intervene to stop this progression leading to this multi-generational disease? Thank you very much. Thank you to my lab and to everyone listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I, I'm going to send you an email after, after this. I have so many questions about okay. your uh, bioinformatics pipeline that you used working with whole genome um, bisulfate sequencing data. Yeah. That's really cool. Super interesting. Um, I have a question about the, the human equivalent of age within zebrafish. I'm not sure mm. if you know this, but you aged your fish out to be about one year of age, correct? Yes. I was wondering, what is the human equivalent to that? Sure, so zebrafish, um, I guess I would look at it differently depending on whether you're looking at their sexual maturity or their mm -hmm. actual lifespan. So zebrafish can live to about five years of age, but at least in our lab, what we've seen is by about a year and a half to two years, even sometimes at a year, their uh, sexual, their, their uh, fertility decreases just in general. So ah, okay. uh, it seems like a larger extent of their lifespan is spent no longer sexually reproductive. So I suppose I would put one year of age at towards um, mid to late adulthood. Okay. Um, not necessarily for the total lifespan, but for their ability to sexually reproduce, if that makes sense. Okay. So when are they able to sexually reproduce then? So depending on, it depends on a few factors, but generally about three to four months. Okay. All right. Got it. Well, wonderful. Thank you. 